You may be seated, and if you would turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. My subject this morning, one wrong thought. Just one wrong thought. You know, the healing of Naaman, the leper, is such a great story that is mentioned by Jesus in the New Testament. It is one of the few miracles that Jesus personally had something to say about in his earthly ministry. This is a great story because it shows that God has unlimited power and that he can heal even the worst of conditions. Let me say that again. You, you need to hear this. This is a great story because it shows that God has unlimited power and he can heal even the worst of conditions. It really doesn't matter what the condition. And the devil is always trying to stop us and to tell us that that we don't have enough faith for something, but I'll tell you what, I hold in my hand the grain, actually I hold a mustard seed, I keep it in my Bible to remind me of what my faith will do and what your faith will do. It says if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, now that's a mustard seed, if you can zoom in on it, but inside of that seed is a grain. So you can see how small the mustard seed is, but think about that little grain. I told one man it was a grain in that, he took a pocket knife, and he said, I'm going to prove you right or wrong. And he, opened, he said, well, it is a grain in there, but you can barely see the thing. But, of course, I'm right because Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed. It shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible to you. With God there are no impossibilities, and all things are possible to him that believes. Go on, praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. But this is a great story. It shows how great God is, but it also shows us that one wrong thought can bar you from your miracle, and that brings me to my text. Look at Isaiah 55 and 8. God said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. One wrong thought can bar you. And one wrong thought can bar me from a miracle. One wrong thought can keep you in bondage for a lifetime. So we need to renew our mind daily with the Word of God. And we need to bring our thoughts into alignment with God's Word. My subject this morning, one wrong thought. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your Word. It's a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. And, Lord, these Old Testament stories, they are illustrations. They are object lessons, Master, of how we are to approach the problems of life and how we are to suit up and we are to be prepared to fight and how we are to submit ourselves in total submission to your word and how, God, that, that we can come to the throne of grace boldly, but we must come with a humble spirit, not in arrogance, not with a haughty spirit, but knowing we have an invitation. And Father, you've invited us today. And Lord, we just thank you and we praise you. And we ask you to seat us together in heavenly places in Christ. Let me preach the everlasting gospel with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Anoint me, Lord. Let people see Jesus. Seat us today with you. And the church said in Jesus' name, amen. amen. The story of Naaman is a great story. Look at 2 Kings 5 and 1. Now, Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Verse 2, And the Syrians had gone out by covenants and brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. Now, Naaman was a leper, and he was dying of an incurable disease, and it touched this little girl who had been taken captive and brought to Syria. Look at 2 Kings 5 and 3. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, I wish that God, that my Lord, that Naaman, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. This story centers around Naaman. Naaman was a famous general from Syria. Naaman was a national hero. He was an outstanding military leader and he had won many great battles. And when he marched across Israel, he captured a little girl and he made that little girl a servant 
to his wife. This little girl was for me with God, and she knew about his saving power. She knew about God's healing power. Hallelujah. And seeing that Naaman was a leper, she said, I wish that my Lord was with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. This little girl, think about it now. She's in a foreign land. She had been taken captive by a foreign army that marched through her nation when they marched across Israel. She could have been bitter. She could have been offended. She could have been filled with hatred. She could have been filled with anger. But instead, she was touched with compassion when she saw the physical condition of Naaman. She had God inside of her. And today we have Christ inside of us. And the Bible says, for who had known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And I like what the Amplified Version says. It says, for we do hold his thoughts, his feelings, and the purposes of his heart. Oh, when you see someone that's struggling, when you see the drug addict, when you see the sinner that's on his way to a devil's hell, when you see the sick, when you see somebody that, that's struggling with issues of life, something should rise up in you and you should say, I want to help that person. That's something in me that reaches out to them. We do hold the thoughts and feelings and purposes of Christ's heart. Go on, praise God that you've been touched by that nail scarred hand and you've got compassion for other people. Hallelujah. Naaman was a leper. He was dying of an incurable disease. And as far as man was concerned, there was no hope, no cure, and he was destined to die. Met anybody like that lately? I see them all the time. And seeing that Naaman was a leper, she said, I wish that my Lord was with the prophet that is in Samaria, because the prophet would heal him of his leprosy. And they told the king of Syria what this little maiden had said. And so the king got a bunch of gold and a bunch of silver together. And he sends Naaman over to the king of Israel with money, with gifts, and with treasures, changes of raiment. He's dressed in his regal robe. He's riding his fine chariot. And he has a letter from the king of Syria. And it said, I have sent my servant Naaman to you. He's got leprosy, and I want you to cure him. And if you'll cure him, all this money, all this gold and silver, and all these treasures, they are yours. And the king rent his clothes. He tore his clothes into and said, am I God? Who does he think I am that I can heal this man? You see, they sent him to the wrong man. That king sent him to another king. But the king didn't have the answer for him. And sometimes we get so full of pride and we get so full of arrogance, we get so full of ourselves that we don't go to the right place. There are people that belong in a Pentecostal church. They say, I'd never go over to a Pentecostal church. And they come and they say, I'd never go to another church. Hallelujah. I met Jesus in power and glory and I found what I've been looking for. I found the power, the presence, the anointing of God. I found the miracle working God. And I'm going back and I'm going to get some more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said more than Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty act. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. That's what we've been doing today. Thank you, Pastor Ricky. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, congregation. We've been praising God and we've been inviting the Spirit of God to come and do where miracles and signs and wonders in the house. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes people go to the wrong place to get healed. You're not going to get very much healing if you go to a church that preaches against healing. You're not going to get deliverance when you go to a church that does not preach deliverance. You're not going to go to... Get a miracle if you go to a church that preaches that the day of miracles is over. You've heard me say it hundreds of times. There's never been a day of miracles, but there is a God of miracles. Hallelujah. And if you get to the right place, and if you get to the right person, I said you got to get to the place and to the person. You got to get to somebody that's connected to God. I mean somebody that's flowing with the power of the Holy Ghost. The woman with the issue of blood, she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. She never touched Jesus. Woo, she touched something that was in touch with Jesus. Ha ha, woo, glory to God. 
Get to the right place. Get to the right person. God has a miracle with your name on it. Hallelujah. You got to go somewhere that they believe in the God of miracles. You got to get among people like Westmoreland. People that have radical faith. People full of the Holy Ghost. People who believe God for miracles. You got to cooperate with God. Anyway, they sent him to the wrong man. And when Elisha heard about it, he said, send him over here to me. Just send him over here to the prophet's house. And they'll know there's a prophet in Israel. Now, you got to remember, Elisha is the man that walked with Elijah. He had a big heart for God. He had so much audacity that he said, I want a double portion of that spirit that is on you. God saw his faith. He walked out his faith. He lived it by faith. He never left the prophet. He stayed with him. And when he was caught up in a whirlwind into heaven, he said, quick, Elijah, drop the mantle. And he got the double portion anointing. So this is the man that says, send him over to me. Hallelujah. Send him over here. Hallelujah. And I'll show you what God can do. And I like to tell people, if you need a miracle from God, come over here to Westmoreland. Come on over. Hallelujah. We believe in miracles. This place is full of miracles. Hallelujah. God is a good God. God is full of mercy. God is full of love. God is full of goodness. God is full of compassion. Hallelujah. I know he's a good God because the Bible said it is the goodness of God that brings us to repentance. I was held in chains of darkness just like you were. But the goodness of God put a draw on my heart. And he lifted me out of the miry clay. Set my feet on the rock to stay. And I've been going on, praise God, just like you. You've been going and going and going and going ever since. Hallelujah. It's the goodness of God. Hallelujah. And we believe in miracles here at Westmoreland, and the place is full of miracles. And we know one thing, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. We know that. We don't just believe that. We know that Jesus heals. We know that he delivers. And we know that he has miracles for people. So if you need a miracle, come on over to Westmoreland. Hallelujah. We got a prayer team here. We got some people radical in faith, and they'll pray for you. And God will do what only God can do. So Naaman, he pulls up in front of the prophet's house. And he sat out there in his chariot. He's got his arms folded. And he told his servant. And this is Naaman's servant. He said, tell the prophet that General Naaman has arrived. And so the servant, he went and he knocked on the door. And Elisha looked out the window. He saw the situation. And he saw everything that was going on. And his Spirit discerned what was going on, and God whispered to the prophet, and he gave him a word of knowledge. He said, I'm going to tell you, prophet of God, how to get this man healed. Hallelujah. And so Elijah sends his servant out to the proud general with a message from God. And he said to General Naaman, go dip seven times in the Jordan River, and your flesh shall come again as a little child, and you shall be healed. And when Naaman heard that, he got mad. And the Bible said he turned and went away. And he went away in a rage. Just one wrong thought can keep you from your miracle. There are people that hear me preach and they say, I don't, I, I, I just won't talk that way. Well, maybe you were taught wrong. I know I was taught some things wrong. But when I get into this book and I find the laws and I find the principles of God, when I look at those examples and those object lessons in the Old Testament, when I find the word of God for what I, I'm looking for and I search it out and I see those principles, I know my God is the same. He doesn't change what worked back then. It'll work then. But I got a new and a better covenant. But it's given me some object lessons that I can draw from so I can be strong in the Lord and the power of his might so I can preach the gospel with power and anointing hallelujah glory to God one wrong thought just one wrong thought can keep you from a miracle look at 2nd Kings 5 and 11 but Naaman was wroth he was angry and he went away and said behold I thought do you see that I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God I thought he'd strike his hands over this place and recover me of this leprosy. 
I thought. And guess what? His thinking was wrong. Why? He said, why doesn't that prophet have enough respect to come out and greet a great man like me? I thought he'd come out. I thought he'd stand. I thought he'd lift up his hand. I thought he'd strike the place. I thought he'd do this. I thought he'd do that. I thought surely he will come out to me, call upon his God, and do some great thing. I thought he would speak words over me, and I would be healed. I thought, I thought, and I thought. And when I, Elijah didn't do what he thought, he went away, and he went away in a rage. Amen. I thought. One wrong thought. It's what I want you to see. Just one wrong thought can bar you from God's miracles. Just one wrong thought can keep you from what God has purposed for your life. Do you know what's wrong that keeps us from getting miracles from God sometimes? We were taught a certain thing under a certain ministry, and we cannot let it go and move on. You've got to get everything lined up with the Word of God. You've got to take the entire Bible and rightly divide the book. And that means somebody's got to study, and somebody's got to get a word from God, and that means you. As well as the prophet, well as the preacher. Amen. Hallelujah. Anyway, he said, I thought, you know, and I thought. But if he had been unwilling to give up his thoughts, guess what? He would have died a leper, and his story would not be in the Bible. And so he turns his horse and his chariot, and he starts back to Syria. He's wroth. He's angry. He went away, but he went away from what? He went away from his miracle because his miracle was waiting in the Jordan. He said, why, man, we got a church, and it's so dignified, and we got clean water there, and oh, back in Syria, and oh, I can go there. Why in the world should I have to go and, and humble myself and, and dip in that muddy, murky, yellow, filthy Jordan River. Why did I have to do that? Because God wanted to change something in his heart. Hallelujah. There's a lot of people, by the way, God wants to change some things in your heart, but you can't come on over to where the fire is. But I want you to watch this story as it unfolds because something got a hold of Naaman. He got a real change. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let me go on with my sermon. Hallelujah. One thought, one thought, one wrong thought can keep you from a miracle. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So don't limit yourself by your thinking. Let me say that again. Don't limit yourself by your thinking. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So get your thoughts and your speaking lined up together. Because there's a law called the law of faith. There's a law called the law of persistence. There's a law called the law of persistence. And you got to work them all. There are laws that control this natural world. There's a law of gravity. And if you throw something up, it's coming down. There's a law of electricity. And if you use it wrong, it'll knock you backwards. Amen. And there are laws in the spirit world. And you got to know how to operate in God's economy in the spirit world. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Don't say I could never. Don't say I don't have enough money to pay my bills. Don't say I could never get out of debt. Don't say I could never take care of my family. Don't say I could never have a happy marriage. Don't say I could never be healthy and strong. Don't hold yourself in bondage by negative thinking and negative speaking. Amen. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. People say, God made me sick. Let me preach a little while. How could God make you sick? God is in third heaven. There is no sickness in heaven for God to make you sick with. So how could God make you sick? Amen? Let me preach a little while. See, the devil is the God of this world. Amen? It's the devil that makes people sick. Oh, Job, the oldest book in the Bible, Job thought that God had done it. No, God didn't do it. He didn't know the narrative. 
God let the heads down and the devil smote him. But God is a good God. And God said, I'm going to give him double for his trouble. That's the kind of God we serve. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> you have to do that? Yes. I'm full. Praise God. Woo! <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let the Holy Ghost loose. Let him do what he wants to do. Don't hold yourself in bondage. How could God make you sick? The devil is the God of this world. He blinds the mind of people to the truth of God's word. And he'll lie. He's the father of lies. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, don't get me mixed up with him. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. That's the kind of God that I serve. I said, that's the kind of God I serve. And that's the kind of God I preach. He's a good God. And the devil is a bad devil. Amen. One wrong thought. And if you believe one wrong thought, guess what? You don't have any word to base your faith on. I said, if you have one wrong thought, you might have a lot of word. But if you got one wrong thought, you don't have a word to base your faith on. And it'll keep you from getting the blessings of God. Hallelujah. See, I got a simple theology. God is a good God. And the devil is a bad devil. We're in a spiritual battle. So suit up, put on the whole arm of God, resist the devil, and guess what? He will flee from you. He will run in holy terror when you speak the name of Jesus, when you whip out the blood, when you speak in tongues. Glory to God, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every imagination and every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing them in captivity to the word. Hallelujah. You got to bring everything in alignment with the word. Now watch Naaman as he recovers in his faith. His servant said, Master, if he'd asked you to do a great thing, wouldn't you have done it? Why don't you do what the prophet said? Why don't you do the simple thing? Why don't you go and dip and get healed? Here's the point. Whatever God tells you to do, do it. Don't, don't close your mind because you don't think a certain way. Open your mind and listen to what God is saying. And let God pour something fresh into your spirit. I said, let him pour something fresh. I have to do it all the time. I said, God, I see through a glass darkly. I need something fresh. Hallelujah. Let God talk to you. Hallelujah. Whatever God says, do, just do it. I love this. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Get an I can do attitude. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said get an I can do attitude. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Miracles come in cans. So get an un, get an I can do attitude. Go on, praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why did the prophet ask him to go dip in the muddy? The prophet said to the general, go down and dip seven times. Go to that Jordan. Get over to that church full of the Holy Ghost. Go over there where those radical people are that speak in tongues. Go over there where those miracles are happening. Go over there and do what God says. And the prophet said, go dip seven times. Hallelujah. In that muddy Jordan, he said, and your flesh shall come again as a little child. Why did God ask him to do that? It was because of his pride. He was proud. He was arrogant. He had a haughty, haughty spirit. You know, faith cannot work in such an atmosphere. Faith can't work like that. Faith works by love. And, and it's the devil's delight to cut us off and shut us off from what God is saying to us. Faith can't work in an atmosphere like that. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. That he may exalt you in due season. Casting all your cares upon him. For he careth for you. The Bible says God resists the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. You, you, you know there are times that I hear this voice. That did say to me something. And 
I know it's the devil trying to get me out of alignment with others in the body of Christ, trying to make me think I'm somebody that I'm not. I am what I am. Don't be what you ain't. Be what you is. Because if you is not what you am, you am not what you is. If you're a little tadpole, don't try to be the frog. If you're a little tail, don't try to wag the dog. You can always pass the plate if you can't exhort and preach. If you're a little pebble, don't try to be the beach. Don't be what you ain't. Just be what you is. Because if you is not what you am, you am not what you is. And I am what I am. By the grace of God, something touched me. Glory to God. Somebody touch me. Hallelujah. I am what I am. By the grace of God. It was God's goodness. It was God's mercy. What I couldn't do, he did it for me. Hallelujah. Naaman needed grace. And the prophet knew what the general needed. He knew what he would have to have to be healed. He knew that Naaman's pride was keeping him from the miracle. And so General Naaman turns his horse in the direction of the Jordan River. And it's 30 to 40 miles away. I, I'm sure that as he was going out sitting in that fine chariot, got those fine Appaloosa horses, he got all those treasures with him. But by now, he's starting to change his mind. And I thought, hey, I'm going to go to that river. I'm going down there as fast as I can get. I got a 30 or 40 mile journey. But I'm going to find out if that old prophet knows what he's talking about. Hallelujah. He said, I'm going to find out if that prophet is sent from God or not. I'm going to find out if he's got the goods. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He made up his mind that it was better to dip than to die takes a humble spirit to make a change like that. You know, there are people like that today. They know they need to be saved. They know there's a devil's hell. They know that they're on their way to hell, but they're self-centered. And their pride will not let them come to Calvary. And there are many Christians that their pride will not them let them totally submit themselves to God. So maybe you just didn't get down as far as I did. But I got down so far that I said, God, whatever you want, I'll do it. I surrender all. I give my life. If you want me to go, I told him, I said, if you want me to go to Africa, I'll go to Africa. I said, if you want me to live single for the rest of my life, God, I'll live single. I said, but if you're going to do that, you're going to have to change me. Thank God it didn't change me. Thank God it gave me a wife. And every time I think about it, I get so happy. Woo! Glory. He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. And I got a good one. Hallelujah. Woo! Look at your wife and say, I got a good one. Relight the flame. Relight it, praise God in Jesus' name. You know, it doesn't take a person very long to get delivered when things change. When you want to change, one touch, <laughs> just one touch from that nail-scarred hand can change you forever. Well, some of you young people go back to the restroom or somebody, bring me some of those paper towels because I left my handkerchief at home and I'm sweating bullets up here. Okay. Hallelujah. One touch. And when God touched you, if you didn't get changed, if you didn't get delivered, you need to cry out to God until you are totally free. Hallelujah. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. That'll stick to my beard, brother. But I thank you for it. You'd give me a cool drink of water, wouldn't you? Hallelujah. Thank you, buddy. Hallelujah. That sticks to my beard, and I walk around with little white spots all over my face. Hallelujah. Have you got leprosy? No, I'm healed. Glory. I'm just preaching about the man that had leprosy. Woo! Hashadamundaya. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Elam. Thank you, Brother Page. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I love this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. All things are passed away. 
Behold what? All things have become what? New. There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Hallelujah. Glory. All things are new. And if you didn't get a change like that, then you need to take another dip in the blood of Jesus. The blood will change you. The blood will wash you. The blood will sanctify you. The blood will heal you. The blood will deliver you. Hallelujah. There's power, power, power. Wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. The devil is a spirit. He doesn't have any blood. So whip out the blood, praise God, and say, I got the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Go and praise God. You know, true repentance, I'm talking about true repentance. It is a change of mind. And you must change your mind before God can ever change your heart. I said, you must change your mind, your thinking, just one wrong thought, before God can ever change your heart. And if you didn't get everything, praise God, Keep coming back to Calvary. Take another dip in the blood. And I promise you, on the authority of God's word, the blood will bring you out. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to God. And so Elijah, he sends this famous general down to the muddy Jordan. And Elisha's message is singing in his mind. <laughs> and he hears it. Go wash in the Jordan. Dip seven times. Don't just take one dip. Come back again and again. Dip seven times. He hears that. And so he's got the message singing in his ears. And Naaman plunges into that yellow, muddy, filthy Murky warden of Jordan. He went all the way down and he went under. I said he went all the way down and he went under. He came up and he went down. He came up and he went down. Down and up. Down and up. Five times. Six times. And he did not hold back any part of himself. He lost his pride. He lost his stubbornness to the word of God. He lost the taste for the things that were in the world. He lost his arrogance. He lost his anger. And he learned total submission to God. I said he learned total submission. Oh, my God, if I could just get a church full of people like that that understand total submission. And when the drug addict comes and the alcoholic, I wouldn't have to spend my time wasting my time. I'm not wasting it. I'm just trying to help you see what God has done. I wouldn't have to spend my time. All it takes is total submission to God. We wouldn't have to pray for you on Friday night. You'd be out here praying for us, with us, and for us, for the harvest of souls that's out there. Glory to God. He lost his pride. And that's what God wants. He wants you to be willing to obey him. He came in total submission. Don't let anything or anyone keep you from total submission. As a pastor, I see people who get saved and people in the church who are on fire for God. They begin to drop a service here. And they drop another service there. And pretty soon, they just drift away from God. You know, this is a day and an age, and we live in a culture that tells you it's all right, it's all right to live together before you get married. Put Hebrews 13, 4 up there. No, it's not all right. It's not all right to live together. It's not. My wife says, don't say shack up. It'll date you. Well, I am dated. Hallelujah. I am who I am. Don't be what you ain't. Be what you is. Hallelujah. Marriage is honorable and all. This is the word of God. And the marriage bed undefiled. But look at this. Now our culture says this is all right. But whoremongers and adulterers. I said whoremongers and adulterers. Let me say it again. Whoremongers and adulterers. 
God will judge. Not the pastor. I'm going to preach to you about the goodness and the mercy. How you can come out. How you can be as free as a bird. Woo! Hallelujah. Glory to God. Ha <laughs> ha. Go on, praise him, brother. Ray, you're free. Hallelujah. Come on, dance a little while. Glory to God. Woo! Hallelujah. What kind of church is Westmoreland? It's a shouting church. It's a dancing church. It's a praising church. It's a church where the power of God is. Hallelujah. Hmm. The world will tell you it's all right to have premarital sex. Young people, listen to me. The world will tell you Older people, married people, it's all right to have an adulterous affair. The world will tell you that alternative lifestyles, lesbianism, homosexuals, that it's all right. Now, God loves everybody. But Jesus caught the woman in adultery, and he said, go and sin no more. Amen. See, that's what we're supposed to do. All have sinned and come short of glory. I'm so glad I don't have to open my closet door and say, look in. Look at what was in pastor's life. You know that people in the church with that sanctimonious look? <laughs> They'll pull your past up. Say, look at him. Look at what they did. Well, I got news for them. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He saved my soul. Hallelujah. He has made me whole. That's what the gospel is all about. We were broken. We were fragmented. We were suffering. We were dying. We were crying. We were sighing. But Jesus. Woo. Stepped in. Come through our walls. I had walls. I couldn't get at them. Let me preach some. If I preach past 12, is that all right? I had walls I had put there. Nobody could get through my walls. But Jesus come through those walls one day said, I'm coming after you, boy. Oh, we got a crazy culture. Don't call them a boy's racial. No, I was a boy. I fought a war as a boy. We got warriors out there. that, 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 that We call them men when you get 21. Their hearts are broken. They're fragmented. And God will have to heal their hurts and pains. But he came through my walls. <laughs> He picked me up and he carried me out. I couldn't get out on my own, but he picked me up and he carried me out. Jericho was straightly shut up. None came in and none went out. When I saw that, I said, Lord, you came through my walls. How, he came through your walls. Go on, praise him. I said he came through your walls. Hallelujah. The world will tell you it's all right to live in a world of sin, a life of sin. But we know what the Bible says. We know how God feels. God loves you, and God is for you. But he wants total submission to the word of God. So he can bless your total life. But he cannot bless the areas of your life where you're practicing sin. He cannot. He just cannot. He wants to bless you. Submit. His obedience to the word of God was the point of contact when Naaman released his faith. And the same is true to you, for you today. So General Naaman, he dipped the seventh time. He wiped the water from his eyes. Hallelujah. He looked at himself. Five, six. He went down the seventh time in total obedience, total submission. He looked at himself, and he was totally healed. And Naaman came out of that water shouting, it is done, it is done. I have obeyed God. My miracle has come. It is done, it is done, it is done. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And God says, Seven times, six times won't do. But I want to tell you, God has miracles for you. You know, one of the greatest parts of this story is when General Naaman was getting ready to return to Syria. I saw this one day. I love it. Because he returned to the man of God. 
That's like coming back to church to say, thank you, thank you, Jesus, for my miracle. He returned to the man of God to thank him for his miracle. Look at this, 2 Kings 5, 15. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing from thy servant. Did you notice that he said, I'm your servant? What an attitude. That arrogant man. I'm General Naaman. Why did he send his servant out here? Now, look at, look at that. For thy servant, henceforth, will offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. One wrong thought had barred him from his miracle. But when he obeyed the prophet and the word of God, not just one miracle was released into his life, but miracle were released into his life. He returned to Syria with more than a healing. He had been saved. He had been changed. He had met Jehovah God, the God of the Bible, and he totally submitted his life to Jehovah God. Hallelujah. No longer would he serve Dagon, the god of Syria. And just before, this is the part I love. Just before he departed for Israel, he asked for two mule loads of that mud. Look at this, 2 Kings 5, 17. And Naaman said, shall thou not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant? What a humble spirit. Naaman said, shall thou not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant? Two mule burdens, two mule loads of earth. For thy servant will henceforth... Neither offer sacrifices or burnt offerings unto other gods, but unto the Lord. And just before he departed, he asked for two mule loads of that mud out of the muddy Jordan. He took that mud back to Syria and erected an altar to God. And Naaman decided, if that leprosy ever tries to come back in my body, I'm going to take some water. I'll just fill it that mud up with water and I'll go back and take seven more dips if it's necessary. Hallelujah. Don't forget, God, come back and take another dip. Hallelujah. Erect an altar to God. Total submission and total obedience. That was the key to his miracle. Oh, saints of God, have you submitted yourself totally to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? For those of you who are not saved that are watching by live stream, I want to pray with you. If you're here in this church and you're not saved, one wrong thought can keep you from being saved. Let us pray. Oh God, I forsake my thoughts. I forsake my ways. I forsake my sins. Oh God, I know I'm a sinner. I know that without Jesus I am lost. But I want to be saved. I won't, don't want to die and go to hell. I need to be saved. I turn my back on sin. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save me. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I believe in my heart you took my sins. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Master. If you pray that a minute from your heart, you're saved. It's just that simple. You've got to get to the right place. You're at the right place. You got to hear the right voice. And God is calling. Let us stand. Let's come to the altar. Let's just praise God for this great salvation. I surrender. I surrender. All to Thee, my Everybody, come that can come please it's the most important part of the service don't leave out that door come to the altar there are people that need your prayer come on have a heart for the harvest come on church let's get together come on pray for somebody that needs a miracle from god i preach my heart out